Hello and welcome to this IQ3 Connect webinar on enterprise deployment of VR technology. My name is David Vaughn and I'll be your host. We are very pleased to have all of you with us today and we're excited to welcome Joe Strelo as our guest speaker. Joe is now the president of AVL Test Systems. And before I turn it over to Joe for his presentation, I'd just like to say that I've collaborated and worked with AVL at various points throughout my career and they are well known in the industry for being innovators. They've often been early adopters of new technology in, in their drive for innovation. And while many companies who live on the cutting edge of technology struggle with the inevitable question of build versus buy, it's my opinion, anyway, that AVL has excelled due to their willingness to adopt hybrid approaches of in-house technology development in parallel with commercial partnerships. I think Joe's presentation today is yet another success story where AVL's hybrid approach to enterprise VR deployment allows AVL to continue delivering best-in-class service to their customers. So with that, gentlemen, I turn over the reins to you, and we thank you for your presentation. Thank you for that introduction, David. Uh, happy to be here, and thank you for uh, inviting us. So, you know, much of this discussion really started with a LinkedIn post I put up in, in April. Uh, Obviously, about March 13th is when uh, COVID started to really shut things down for us. And I changed my LinkedIn profile in April and said I wouldn't change it back until this is over. And I, uh, I guess I, I meant at the time when this is over and I can start working with customers again in person. Um, obviously, that hasn't happened yet, and it's a little bit disappointing. But I made another prediction at that time. I said... Uh, that uh, we would not go back to working the same way we had prior to uh, COVID. And that is turning out to be more and more uh, true uh, as time goes by. So I posted this and I got a lot of actually really interesting feedback and it started a lot of interesting conversations with folks uh, who reached out via LinkedIn and, and other ways. And uh, there's definitely a lot of interest in the industry to see that we adopt new technology and we don't waste this opportunity uh, where we've had a real jolt to our daily lives and where we've been forced to make changes and we want many of those changes to stick around. We want them to be durable and lasting. So today I would like to share with you uh, some of the ways that AVL has adopted the VR technology and, and by the way also some AR technology. Uh, during this time to keep things moving along. And in many cases, this kept millions of dollars worth of projects still storming along pretty much at pace. Um, again, my name is Joe Strelo. I am currently the president of AVL Test Systems as of very recently. Um, when I agreed to do this, I was vice president of engineering. And I'm sorry if this disappoints you uh, somewhat to now be listening to a president. Um, I know for me personally, I would much rather listen to a VP of engineering talk about this subject than a president. But uh, I hope your disappointment is, is uh, dispelled here uh, as we go through the presentation. So um, I think it's important that I just take two slides, just two slides to just kind of give you some context about AVL for those who don't know us well. Uh, AVL has been involved in the development of really innovative ground vehicle technology since around 1948. Uh, at that time, and at one time, even in fairly recent times, that meant gasoline and diesel engines. But today it means hydrogen fuel cells, batteries, uh, electric motors. And we continue to be leaders in delivering the tools and technology that it takes to make electrified vehicles come to market and to get them to market quicker and at cost and at scale. Uh, we do about 2 billion euros of business globally. Uh, we have a staff of more than 10,000 people globally. And that staff increasingly is involved in other topics as well that you may not recognize from AVL, ADAS and Autonomous. Um, and a growing field is really the data intelligence piece as well. So. Um, a lot of very interesting things going on, and, and obviously we, we have a very large infrastructure, so uh, have a very uh, uh, nice uh, base from us for us to build on. We really have three three legs of the business, if you will. We provide the engineering services component uh, under 
uh, one structure. That's really engineering consultants, really high technology uh, folks who are there to help uh, develop your technology with you or to bring specific competence to a development program. The middle box there is the part that I'm responsible for in North America. And this is the instrumentation and test systems part of the business. Uh, this business is delivering automation software and heavy hardware along with a typically a pretty complex set of instruments, sensors, and then all of the complexity of integrating all of that with your facility. So these are our you know, many times projects, but then we also deliver the, the instruments and things on their own. But that's really this middle box, and that, that's a, a tool set that allows our customers to, to, to develop and validate their designs uh, on their own. And then we have a smaller part of the business, but it, absolutely growing and important part of the business, and that's the CAE technology part. This is called advanced simulation technologies. These are very specific tool chains that are designed around the tasks that our customers, you know, encounter. So, not general purpose tools per se, but but uh, very specialized tools. So, so again, in the context of the discussion we're going to have, it's all around this middle box and the sorts of things we do there. So, you know, let's just jump right in. I want you to think first about how you do design reviews today. If they look like this. Uh, which I'm betting they don't, but if they do, then you're absolutely ahead of about 90% of the industry. And I, I don't, you don't need me to tell you that you're ahead, but very soon this will change and you won't be ahead anymore. You'll be one of the crowd. The way design reviews are done historically, it has to change. It simply has to change. And frankly, if you're not digitizing your design review uh, process right now, digitalizing it, then very soon you're gonna find yourself in the minority. More importantly, as you look at these slides, I'm, the, the presentation that I prepared is very movie based. So these movies tend to jump around a lot. So you see how fast this movie is, is bouncing around. I know it's probably a little hard to watch, but I, what I want you to take away from that is how dynamic this environment really is. So this movie wasn't done as a promotional video. This is actually an interaction between I, sorry, two of my colleagues, but they're interacting with the design. Once you get comfortable within the technology, what you find is that it becomes a very dynamic uh, environment in order to have these sorts of technical discussions. Much, much more dynamic than doing this on paper or on a PowerPoint or something the traditional way. And I guess that sort of leads me to my kind of first point here. The old paradigm is really this sort of everybody gathers around a table and they put a whole bunch of maybe paper, there's typically a whiteboard and they're presenting something on the screen. And, um, and then these tend to be grueling all day meetings on a, on a complicated project. This is typically at least a one day meeting. And I like the Wikipedia definition. It says it's a milestone within a product development process. Well, I, I, this isn't my vision for a design review. Design reviews should be a continuous process and they should come with a systems engineering perspective. And they need to, to really focus on the high level functional requirements, not just the detailed technical specifications, those are important, but to meet in an environment where you can not lose sight of the high level functional requirements is really critical to me. It has to be a cross-functional team and whenever possible, you should include your customer. And sometimes it's not practical and it's not even wanted and certainly the engineers often don't want that. But whenever possible and practical, the customer should really be part of that discussion. And the output of these meetings has to be more than a flat set of documents. So many times I see the output of a design review and it's, it's a set of check boxes and, and notes, oh, this red line has to be changed or that isn't acceptable or we gotta come back to that and some action items or whatever. These flat documents are, are really uh, very much part of history in my mind. The output of these meetings should be some rich documentation. And ideally, they should include a, an, an asset that can continue to march through the project with you. 
And I'll give you some examples of that now. So, you know, what if a design review looked more like this, where I could invite the participants to, this is a space with kind of, it's kind of a hollow deck approach. So you have a, a meeting space where people are sitting around the table, just like you were in, in person, except without all the coffee cups and leftover sandwich wrappers. He's sitting around a table together, and then you can bring digital content into that middle space. And the host of this can prepare the digital content remote and in advance. They can prepare it remotely and keep the meeting focused on a specific topic and you know, only bring in the content that they want folks you know, to focus on today. Honestly, the preparation for this really shouldn't take any longer than a traditional design review process. There's no, nothing that needs to be printed. There's nothing that needs to be bound. And when you're done, the whole episode, the whole interaction can be recorded as documentation. That's essentially what you're seeing here is three people got in a room and they were looking at how these, these are powertrain dynamometers, how they're connected to the wheels of this vehicle or what, they're, what is proposed. And the whole thing can be recorded. So this sort of virtual conference room can be set up with the digital content available, and it can be left open as well. This is certainly, in my mind, during this time, the perfect antidote to not being able to go to the office and take over a conference room. So, you know, and in addition, you can bring in other content. You know, you can still bring in flat documents. You can still bring in PowerPoint, um, and there are ways to do that. So here's another example. Instead of sitting around a virtual room, here we have people actually joining to walk through a design uh, of a test cell together. So this is a test system for testing battery packs for large vehicles or for um, commercial vehicles. You see the pack is quite large uh, and it's sitting on top of a shaker. That's what he's pointing at there. What we're able to do is actually get three people together. They were able to come into the space together. They can look at the entire design as it stood at that at that point in the design process. And the, the issue that we had concerns about were around how much space there was to actually maneuver within the test cell. And you can see that, you know, yes, you can take some measurements, but more importantly, you when you're in the environment, you very quickly realize whether or not it's going to work or not, whether it's going to be safe or not. The other thing that we've done here is that we've made sure that we included the cables and the hoses and things that need to be connected to the, the test article. We've made sure that those are routed also in a way that they aren't trip hazards, you're not ducking underneath them. By doing this in a virtual reality environment, like I said, it just becomes a much more intuitive interaction. You know, and when you look at, at again, how the, the team members here are moving around in the space. It's very natural. Notice when they talk to each other, they actually look at each other, which is kind of interesting. Like there's no real reason to do that. But actually as you're working in the space, it you pretty quickly become, it becomes a very natural response. And by doing this sort of thing during the project, uh, we can avoid a lot of really expensive design modifications that show up when the, the system arrives on site. So all of that cable routing and uh, hose routing and things, you know, it seems like it's trivial. It's not part of the focus many times of the, of the core design, but those things can be very, very expensive to change or to fix or maybe impossible to fix when it arrives on site. So it just becomes a very useful uh, exercise and it's very quick and easy to do given these tools. This environment then becomes a pretty valuable digital asset as you enter into the production phase as well. So now, you know, you get sign off, you say everything is ready to go. What's interesting is that we actually, this is the same containerized solution for that battery uh, test system. So you recognize the components in there, but we actually use this now to do factory acceptance as well. So we started with the digital asset that we created, the environment and the basic shape of the container. And now as the system was built, we were able to actually go in and scan the interior of the, the test system. And that point cloud data was integrated with 
that previous digital asset that we used during the design process so that the customer could verify that in fact things were installed and actually were realized in the same way that they were approved. Again, in a time of very limited access to travel, you know, most of, of this sort of equipment for me, many, or much of it is built in Europe. Um, even in good times, it's very difficult to get customers approval to travel to Europe. We very much like to have a factory acceptance. It reduces a lot of risk uh, when we arrive on site. So we very much rather catch things uh, at the factory. So this is a pretty cost effective way to eliminate an awful lot of risk and give the customer some reassurance that when it arrives, it's going to work. And again, you know, check a box, make sure that that uh, we have good documentation that that everything is approved by the customer before we ship. For me, this is a game changer. This is a massive game changer. We don't have to wait for a customer to be available to travel or even for me or one of my team to travel. We can we can fire this up as soon as the, the digital asset is ready to go and customer can join and we can knock this out in a couple hours, something that might've took a week or two weeks to, to organize and, and to execute in the past. So it's a really, really, really big deal. And I think the other thing, notice there's sort of a theme here of creating a digital asset that then we reuse throughout uh, you know, the, the development of a project. This video is pretty interesting. Before I start this, I want you to start to think a little bit about uh, synchronous and asynchronous design review content. We spend a lot of time in design reviews often getting folks oriented to what we're presenting. Honestly, it wastes a lot of time. This is interesting because we can also create an environment like this and it can we can create a meeting space that's open and then as the customer is getting themselves prepared for the design review, they can actually go and experience it themselves and get oriented to it. There's the ability to actually do this as a, a guided tour or to give some instruction in advance of what to go look at. And in this case, uh, you see that the test system here, you can actually open the door. This is a, again, it's a battery test facility and these are cell testers. These load drawers um, were something that was had been discussed quite a lot with the customer. And so there's an opportunity to come in prior to a design review and actually get, get themselves oriented and to try out some things. You can see that they're interacting with the model by themselves. There's no additional handholding that has to be done here. And this sort of pre-design review meeting orientation can save a lot of time, as I said. And also, if you're working with an international client base, as we are, it allows people to do it on their own time, even sometimes just setting up a, a time where everybody is available. Uh, you know, it's, it's a logistics challenge. This allows people to do it on their local time or do it in evenings and weekends as we're all working from home. You can leave this available and people can interact with it whenever they're ready. And then uh, they can be prepared for a design review or maybe they're not attending the design review and they can give some informed input to the team. So not only does it allow you to save a lot of time in the meeting, makes the meeting more efficient, but you can actually broaden the number of people that give you input to the design, which is often a really valuable thing you know, to get more input from more stakeholders. This is an example of, of using the tools to do an ergonomic assessment. Much of our equipment is actually used in a production environment. So this is the rigging that needs to be uh, attached to an engine at the end of the production line so that it can be tested. And you know this sort of complex rigging uh, is pretty expensive. A prototype of this sort of rigging is tens of thousands of dollars. Historically, we probably would have done some things in SolidWorks and made some little movies and things. And that's useful, but there's really no substitute for letting a customer come in and actually interact with it and get the kinematics of it, really assess whether this is going to work in their production environment. You know, obviously there's no force feedback here, but often the force feedback metrics for a production environment are pretty hard. They're objective numbers and we can work with those separately, but just the, the comfort and the interaction with the rigging, you know, that that's often a, a bit more subjective. And this allows you to come in and do that. And again, doing it in the digital way before we have to spend a lot of money on parts. This is a pretty interesting example as well. This guy over here on the left, this is sort of the traditional approach, right? If somebody wants to 
understand the piping and the flow in a in a complex environment typical of an oil and gas environment for example you know you show up with a flow schematic on a piece of paper and with your hard hat on and you go have to figure out which pipe is what and what what does what imagine when you have all of these pipes like this and this is actually another containerized test cell but it's not really important what you actually are able to do here in our environment is we actually created some tools and some visualization tools so that during the design review we could show the customer where his chilled water comes from where it goes you see actually some of the lines are under the floor um, how it flows through the systems that are are located co-located with the test article and then we were able to actually create different colors and, and uh, flow schematics, visual flow schematics for all of the various subsystems here. Again, this creates a, a, a really great digital asset that goes with the, the product that we delivered to the customer. If you can imagine orienting a new operator or more, maybe more importantly, a new service uh, technician to understanding what does what and which way the flow directions are within something this complicated, what all the media are. This is a pretty simple and intuitive way to explain that to somebody coming into, you know, coming into this environment. And again, it's something that we've left behind with the customer now. Personally, I really love this because this sort of plumbing and piping problem has always been a, an issue in our industry. So I've showed you some examples here. As David mentioned, we use a hybrid approach uh, within AVL. The examples I've been showing you are from an internally developed environment uh, that we, we're quite fortunate we have a large software uh, activity and we have a team centrally that has developed these tools and then and they can be you know created and adapted in, in pretty clever ways for our customers. But I wanted to show you also within the IQ3 environment obviously our hosts here today, that it works pretty much the same way. In fact, there are applications where, you know, this solution is actually just because of its availability to you, it, it is maybe more intuitive actually to use during the design process. What we do and what I do, I've, I've been a customer of, of the IQ3 product for a long time, even before we had an internally developed solution. Personally, I use it as an interface to SolidWorks. I hate the interface to SolidWorks and I don't use it every day. And if I need to look at a SolidWorks model of a system that's going to a customer, I actually prefer to bring the SolidWorks model into the IQ3 environment. If you want to invite somebody to that environment to experience it uh, with you, it works exactly like sending a Zoom or a WebEx invite. In the AVL solution, uh, it's a little bit different. We actually have you download an application. You launch the application, takes you right into our environment. In this case, it works just like inviting you to Zoom or to WebEx or to Skype. You have a calendar invite. There's no application to download. And so right from the calendar invite, you launch and it launches within a web browser and you're off and running. Essentially what this does is it, it creates VR really on demand. The product is able to bring in native CAD data or CAE data, and it can also bring in the scan data. When I showed you the scan of the actual test cell for factory acceptance, it, it's able to read that natively. The nice thing is, is by reading that data natively like this, you saw the user is actually interacting with actually one of the parts directly. You do have uh, full access to the model tree, so you can turn on and off elements. Like I said, it, for me personally, it, it's a better environment uh, for me to review things than SolidWorks. The product also has a digital sign-off for design changes. The meeting can be hosted on a, on a, a personal or a business uh, machine. Uh, it can also be managed on a server behind your firewall. It can be managed by your IT department. They can support you with uh, cloud-based options as well. Um, I've actually tried all of these options over the years um, different for different things. And uh, so I know they all work. You know, I, I think this is a very good commercial solution uh, if you want to start bringing design reviews in, uh, into a VR environment. Excuse me, Joe. Would you mind if we pause here for a couple of questions? The first is you mentioned that you work with your customers in the VR environment during the development process to modify and adjust the design. Can you tell us if you ever have issues with accessibility 
For example, what are the IT requirements on the customer side? So I, I would say that the, you know, much of the, the software environment and the supporting software environment has become really stable. We still occasionally run into firewall issues, you know, with, you know, if customers are trying to do this from, you know, behind their own firewall at the office, for example, we do run into some issues where this stuff is blocked. So it's important to work with your IT department to make sure that, and with the customer's IT department to make sure it works. Strangely, you know, I, I say this is a great enabler for a time when many of us are working remotely. Um, many of these tools actually work better from home than they do from behind your corporate firewall. We've also run into issues primarily customers don't have enough of the hardware around to support this. For many years, and I have one right here, for many years, if you went to your IT department and said, I need a laptop for doing VR, and they'd say, well, give me the spec, you'd end up with a laptop that looked like this. So they'd make this, you know, they basically would have to buy a gamer's laptop. So much of this technology has been built around gaming, which while I appreciate that that got us to scale and drove down the cost and, and, and helped support the, the development, um, it wasn't really very helpful <laughs> for those of us who were trying to deploy this in the enterprise. It's only recently, actually, that I can buy a conservative-looking Dell business laptop that will support VR. And so that, that's actually a huge step forward, because if you go to your, your IT department and ask them to buy you a gaming laptop at most companies, they laugh you out of the IT department, even when you're the VP of engineering, by the way. So that's been an issue. By the way, you can interact in most of these environments. Uh, you can interact from even like the laptop I'm using right now is just a, a small 13 inch little simple uh, business laptop. You can interact in 2D, so that's not really an excuse. But if you want the full experience, um, finding the right hardware uh, sometimes can be an issue. Headset hardware, it can also be an issue. And we I've been through quite a lot of the headset hardware and it's been evolving as well. Um, actually on the screen behind me, you see a, a Quest, a wireless uh, system, which is pretty nice. Um, some of the products uh, that are out there have not really supported all the headsets that are on the market. Does that answer your question, David? Kind of a long yeah, I, think so. I think so, no, that was good. Um, the one other question real quick that uh, is related to the slides you've been talking to uh, mm -hmm. here is, um, you, you, you talked a bit about the continuous, this idea of the continuous uh, process, design mm -hmm. review process. And just there was a question about whether IQ3 was a good fit for, for that kind of solution with this continuous design process. Yeah, I, I, I believe it really is. Um, again, being able to bring in the CAD, quite, it, it's, it's very simple to, to bring in the CAD data directly. So as, as your engineering team is, is developing the design, um, you know, it, it only takes, you know, for something like this model that you're seeing here, this takes less than 10 minutes and you're, you're in IQ3 environment. So, you know, as designs evolve, it's a, a very intuitive and quick way to, you know, bring in the latest and, and then get people around it and, and, you know, get buy in on changes or, or be looking at it. Great, great. Thanks. We'll save the rest of these questions uh, for the Q&A session at the end. Joe, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no problem. So the next thing, and and, and that section of, of my presentation was by far the longest because it's a, a topic that I'm quite passionate about, this idea of the continuous design review. But I just want to touch pretty quickly on two additional uh, use cases for for this sort of VR technology in an engineering environment. Think just carefully about where your critical resources are. Uh, we always, or maybe not always, but certainly for the last decade or two, uh, there was not really any issue with getting critical resources into the country uh, whenever you needed them. So uh, very often I'm, I'm trying to get resources from Europe, primarily Austria, Czech Republic, Germany. All of a sudden COVID hits and there's a travel ban. And it's not something that we'd ever really experienced before. So really think about where are your critical resources located and do you really, now that you've experienced the last six months, do you really believe that you'll always have access to them? 
So we were in the middle of a very, very large project uh, out in California, and we had planned to bring, we, we had our, our own local resources as well, but in order to execute this project at, at the pace of the, of the building, um, we were augmenting our own resources with uh, European resources. And suddenly they're not available. So to keep this project on track, which by the way, was worth millions of dollars in revenue and significant impact to our bottom line, not to mention the fact that it kept the project on track for the customer. We had to get creative pretty fast. So we actually really stepped up our installation documentation game here and something I'm pretty proud of. Um, this is a, again, a chassis dyno, actually similar to the last example or nearly exactly the last example. And what we did is we, we were actually able to bring our rigging company, uh, the gentleman that is running the on-site activities for us in California. We also brought resources from the Czech Republic into this environment and from Plymouth, Michigan, where, we're, where I'm based. And we were all in this environment and we went step-by-step step through installing the system. So essentially what you see on the ground there right now is week one. This is about a week's worth of work to get these first rails and, and uh, hardware installed. And you see this up in this picture in the upper right here. That's actually a live shot or a shot from the, the job site itself. But we were actually able to bring everybody in. Actually, this turned into a weekly meeting for a while. And this environment was just left open. The team could meet whenever they wanted. And then there was a regularly scheduled kind of Monday morning get aligned meeting. And again, you actually, you'll see actually, as people were getting comfortable, how they're moving around in here and setting these first roll set modules in place. And here we are in the digital environment and we notice that there's actually an interference. And so we actually had a pretty rich discussion about what's going on here. And so it turns out that's just a fan housing. And, uh, but it was interface error interfering a little bit with this cat track. So it was something that probably would have caused questions uh, on site. Turned out it was a, just a model update issue, but um, so it was a non-issue, but it really allowed the team to work with the folks back at the factory and then also the engineering team in Germany and actually resolve these issues and these questions in a virtual space. They spent an hour Monday morning, got prepared for the week, and then uh, the tool was available uh, throughout the installation. So I'm, I'm proud to say that we've, we've really kept this project moving along at a very good pace. You see that actually we've installed the first one. By the way, we're installing 13 of these systems of various sizes, seven of this size, and then three of a very large size, and then some small systems for motorcycles and ATVs in this facility. So we've been able to keep a very, very, very large project on track. And you know the, the, the impact to our, our financial year is, is massive. And uh, we actually, I don't think we could have done it without having some tools like this available. This example is getting pretty dated, but I wanted to show it anyway. One of the things that, uh, you know, when you're training new staff, one of the, we've, been, we've been brainstorming within AVL about how do we bring new staff on board in this environment? And this is another nice way to just open up this environment. They can't break anything. They can't hurt themselves and turn somebody loose and just get comfortable with what what they're going to step into. So this is an operator thinking about, you know, uh, this is an end of line heavy duty engine test cell. And so this is just uh, understanding what actually they're gonna be asked to do and what does the environment look like and feel like. The other cool thing we can do is again, kind of like the rigging example, you're able to take somebody who may not have any experience with engines, frankly, and train them to rig them to run the end of line tests. So here is a simple thing is, this, you know, this is the flywheel, you know, find the flywheel on the table and that's gonna have to be mounted here. So we can do a lot of this sort of uh, training of the support team that is gonna be working at the, in the end of line environment. We can develop some of these, these environments to, to train the folks as well. And again, it's kind of this idea of this digital asset that stays with the with the system uh, over the life of the system. And then I just wanted to spend a couple minutes and just talk about where we're going uh, with the technology. So 
talked a lot about engineering space. It was really centered not on the people, but on the, the thing that we're building or designing. Um, this is really something we're playing with right now is should we use this for meeting spaces and should we develop custom avatars for our employees? So somebody thought this was funny to make a custom avatar of me over there on the right. Looks nothing like me. I, my hair is certainly not that gray. But you can see, you know, it's kind of a natural interaction to go and, uh, you know, interact with a whiteboard, turn around, talk to your colleagues. Um, you actually see the people. Um, it, it's pretty interesting. And a few weeks ago with my wireless Quest headset, um, certainly powerful enough for this sort of environment, um, for the first time in many, many months, I was able to meet with Stefan and, uh, and also with um, some of our other management in Graz around this table in the conference room. And frankly, it was very nice to even virtually to shake someone's hand you know, almost a personal connection that we simply have lost during this time. And, uh, and it was, again, it was quite natural. Still some work to be done there um, in terms of just ease of use. And, and I think some practice is involved to learn how to use that whiteboard properly. Uh, it's not quite as easy as going up to a physical whiteboard, but I believe the technology is going to get there. And uh, this might be the business meeting of the future, actually, for us instead of traveling all the time. You know, one thing we've realized during this time is how much money we could save on travel. And then one more kind of out there idea that I wanted to share. The idea of 360 degree tours of our key installations around the world. So this is actual uh, 360 photos and that can be linked together. And then again, offering some info points. So this is sort of a, uh, an augmented sort of solution here where uh, many times when we wanted to uh, educate our own people or or bring a customer and and uh, show them around our some of our key facilities globally, we would travel there. This is a nice way to maybe do it without again when we can't travel. This technology is pretty available today with the 360 degree cameras pretty widely available, and then just linking them together and providing some interactive content. And this is my kind of out there idea. Um, it's kind of a idea and a technology looking for an application at this point, but I'm going to share it with you because maybe somebody's got the perfect application. So here we are in the VR environment of a test cell again. And actually, you can go over to one of our devices. This is a fuel measurement system. And you can connect to live streaming data from that device. So you see it connecting. And because the data is, is being hosted and you know we can get access to it this way you can then create this virtual environment that's maybe not entirely virtual that this is actual live streaming information but it's coming into a virtual environment so um, i think you'll see them turn on you know what is the actual temperature of the fuel at various sensor points and things so um, I can think of lots of cool things that I'd love to do with this. I'm just not entirely, I haven't convinced myself of the value of them yet, but I do think that there's something here. You know, again, I don't know if it's a training uh, tool. I don't know if it's a service and support tool, uh, but there's definitely something here and it's something that we're working on. Uh, with that, I'd just like to kind of wrap up. I think you've heard some common themes throughout, you know, some of the examples that I showed. Um, it really comes down to the fact that, like many of you, ABL is in the midst of digitalizing our business. Uh, the, events, the events of the last seven months have really accelerated this activity. It's something that we were already doing, but it has definitely accelerated by necessity. And it, we certainly see this at most of our customers as well. So, you know, I talked several times about having a digital asset that carries through the life of a, an opportunity. You really see that there's value at the pre-operational part. This is the design reviews and those sorts of things. There's a there's a, certainly a place for these things in, in better operating your environment uh, once the systems are running. And while I didn't touch on it very much, I think there's certainly a, an element here where VR can, can support sustainment and serviceability of the equipment long-term. 
So David touched on it earlier, and I'll just wrap up with sort of a few comments. As I said earlier, we've adopted a hybrid approach. Having a large software development activity enabled that. And actually, we were an early adopter. I would I would argue we were an early adopter, particularly the team me or kind of around my own personal interest, but certainly in the US, we were, we were toying around with this uh, very early on. And we ended up with a hybrid model just because there's always this, this trade-off between a commercial versus an in-house developed solution. You, know, you have to balance the cost of development versus the cost of licenses and the cost of having those, those people and, and uh, the infrastructure to support them. Um, you know, what capabilities, how fast can you keep up with, as I said, you know, the headsets are changing quite rapidly and there's new players coming online. So being able to keep up with the, you know, the emerging technologies and the evolving technologies, you know, you have to, to think about that. Do you want a commercial software that probably will keep up a little bit faster or do you want to be able to control it? Again, I think, you know, what we started early and we, I, you know, I was working with IQ3 very early on and we were kind of looking at applications and trying to scale this up uh, to support what I wanted to do with it. Um, then we started our own internal activity, you know, and, and now honestly, we're both. So um, just behind the laptop I'm using right now is a laptop with the IQ3 software on it as well. So as I noted, I, I'm also a user. I think with with those final comments about you know thinking about the digitalization of of your business and and how you're going to apply that throughout the life cycle of your products, maybe I'll just uh, I'll open it up for uh, for any questions. Thanks, Joe. Some really great points in there and good examples, uh, of course. Before we go to the question and answer, we wanted to give a demonstration of the uh, IQ3 Connect software. So we've got Colin Bloor on board here to uh, take us through a, a demonstration. And uh, this is going to be a very high level demonstration. We, some key takeaways are just how easily accessible the environment is. Joe talked about that a little bit. You know, across the enterprise, you've got varying hardware accessibility. And so you need something that can be accessed with or without the uh, VR headsets or various levels of computer memory and that kind of accessibility. Also the collaborative nature of the environment as well as how easily it is to manage the content. And most of all, to give you a perspective, you know, Joe's had some great uh, videos. I want you to also take that away from, from this demonstration, hopefully, that, that immediately when you're in the environment, you just get that spatial perspective that you can't get from looking at a Zoom chair. Right. So, Colin, I'm going to let you take it away from there, please. Sounds good. Thank you, David. All right. Yeah, so as, you know, Joe's presentation had a lot of great videos showing the VR environment itself. I'm going to touch on that a little bit, kind of into the specifics of IQ3. But I also want to touch a bit on, you know, some of the, I guess, less glamorous aspects of VR deployment. And that's kind of the underlying architecture and some of the key features you know, of our software that really enables a, a global deployment throughout the enterprise. And I think you know, we've touched on this a bit. Uh, you know, one of the key features is that IQ3 is a cloud-based platform. Uh, so whether that's installed on you know, an AWS type environment or installed on-prem uh, behind your company's firewall, regardless of the deployment mechanism, the user experience is the same. You're using, you know, your standard web browser, Firefox, Chrome, Edge, to access the, the IQ3 environment. And what kind of anchors that environment is what we call our dashboard. It's a content and meeting management platform uh, that really enables you to manage the CAD to VR process. You can also manage your meetings, your meeting settings uh, as well, um, you know, just like you would with any of the web conferencing applications. But beyond kind of web conferencing, we also, you know, have the CAD model, the VR models, and, and managing that CAD to VR process. And a lot of the challenge over the last couple of years has been really streamlining going from CAD models to uh, these VR-ready tessellated models that can be, uh, you know, collaborated with by multiple users from all over the world. And so I just want to give a, a quick demonstration of how that works in IQ3. Uh, you have your 3D content, whether it's CAD, point cloud simulation, you select your model, maybe it's the top level assembly, maybe it's a sub-assembly, and you click create VR model and you're off to the races. As Joe mentioned, the model I'm going to show took about 10 minutes to process the content management platform. 
Uh, you know, you can manage various other sorts of assets as well. Uh, maybe it's video files or audio files. Um, you know, maybe it's, you know, managing viewpoints or documents or screenshots as well. So through a platform like this, you're able to manage all your content, you know, through a web browser. So no matter where you are, you have access to that underlying data. Uh, additionally, a, a key feature is really integrating into your business process so that you can really deploy this throughout the enterprise with, with minimal friction. So we have tools for integrating into single sign-on systems, for integrating into the, you know, your email server so you can send meeting invites or get alerts, et cetera. And additionally, we do have, you know, API documentation so that you can integrate IQ3 and this VR technology into other sorts of solutions. And so with kind of discussing that less glamorous approach, I kind of want to, I want to jump into the IQ3 meeting space to, to show everybody a, a quick demo of, you know, what the interface looks like and, and how it behaves. So as you can see, you, you interact through a web browser. You have your meeting link, you know, as you would with any sort of Zoom or, or uh, WebEx. Uh, and this is what you can use to, to share with your colleagues to invite them to meetings uh, to have this collaborative session. You know, one of the points Joe raised was hardware availability has, has been an issue and is, is becoming a little bit less so, but is, is still a problem, especially when you're dealing with customers who might not have that VR expertise yet. Uh, and so it's important when deploying a VR solution is to, you know, make sure you're not prohibiting anybody from joining and participating regardless of their hardware availability. So we've developed a, a 2D interface that has 98% of the same functionality as what you see in the VR space. So you are actually in the 2D environment. You are able to move around, interact with other people. Uh, as you saw, you, you have your own avatar as well. We call this desktop VR mode uh, just because, you know, even though you're viewing it on a flat screen, you're still in the VR environment. You have a spatial position. Other people can see you. You can interact as well. You're not limited just because of, of any hardware limitations. And in this mode, you can use tablets or cell phones or you know, your standard business laptop to join these design reviews or, or training sessions. Just to give you a quick demonstration, you know, you're, you're not limited by what you can do in, in the VR space. You still have access uh, to the various tools you need to manipulate the model, take measurements, uh, whatever it might be to, to interact, to explore, and to, to review the design. You can also explode the model here. I'm just going to show a couple of the uh, capabilities. All right, I'm going to jump into VR mode now. And so with VR comes some additional benefits. You know, Joe mentioned repeatedly, and I won't, you know, harp on too much, but you, you get the true spatial perspective. So, you know, what does half a meter mean? What does that mean for people moving around, equipment moving around that space? With the VR equipment, you, you get that, uh, natural spatial uh, intuition and are able to make uh, decisions on those. Additionally, with VR, you can interact with the model in a much more intuitive way. So, you know, I, I just showed a quick example in 2D mode of, of manipulating the object using, using the mouse, but with VR, you can actually grab components uh, as if you were physically interacting with them. Uh, and what's good about IQ3 is we bring in the CAD structure as well. We have the model tree available. So if moving things around component by component doesn't make sense for your particular design review or application, uh, you can actually change that. So you can actually on the fly decide how you want to interact with your model. So I'm going to pull up the model tree real quick just so you can get an idea of what it looks like in the VR environment. And we can we use the, the find in tree feature. We can select the component. I'll highlight it so you can see it. We can actually navigate our way uh, up the model tree to select the, the sub-assembly or the assembly that we actually want to interact with. And from here, I can move this as one whole unit. so that you are interacting with it in a, in a much more intuitive way. Additionally, you know, if you're bringing in users who don't have the CAD experience, uh, you can also create a group out of the, the selected components, and they can be from different sub-assemblies. Uh, you know, CAD structure isn't always you know, as uh, intuitive or doesn't always make sense depending on how you want to interact with the model. Uh, so we allow you to kind of create shortcuts on the fly uh, in order to, you know, allow your users to more intuitively interact with the model. Uh, so right now we're creating a shortcut to all these components. Uh, once it gets created, I'll just give it a quick name. 
The other thing that you can do with IQ3 is we've talked about, Joe talked about an asynchronous design review process and, and how that can be accomplished. Uh, and what IQ3 enables is the user to store their interactions as, you know, different model states or scenes. Uh, so, for example, you know, if we're coming over here, we can see kind of similar to the uh, uh, interference and clash that uh, Joe talked about in one of his earlier videos. Uh, we can actually see it in this model, too. I believe it was a, um, a fan assembly that was interfering with the track uh, uh, for, this, uh, for this piece of equipment. And so not only can you draw on the model on the fly, you can also create annotations as well. And actually save these for uh, users to come in at another time in order to see the model. What we're trying to accomplish with IQ3 is, is you know, not these, you know, there's times and place for these picture perfect, you know, high uh, photorealistic scenes. Uh, what IQ3 is aiming to achieve is a more, you know, spontaneous design review process where you come in, you take your notes, you can spawn a whiteboard on the fly um, and, you know, sketch up whatever it is that uh, you want to brainstorm or draw and, and save this as an image file um, or, uh, you know, allow this to be placed in the environment for other users to come see at a later time. Obviously, you know, with the meeting link, I could have other people join me uh, as well, and we can be collaborating in this space together. Well, IQ3 can use the same underlying data structure, that same CAD model to facilitate more than just one use case. Uh, so a lot of time in you know, VR approaches, especially with uh, using the gaming engines, is, is content creation. Uh, can be a time consuming and expensive process, uh, necessary for, for many applications, but there's going to be some instances, a lot of instances of, of you know, informational training applications where a, a, a quick and dirty kind of informational um, scene can be deployed rapidly. So for example, you know, we can, if we want to introduce somebody to, you know, what exactly this is, you know, we can, you know, insert videos on the fly. Uh, this list, as you will see, is populated from our content management system. And so you can upload videos, uh, images, documents, whatever it might be on the fly. So you can incorporate videos. You know, I've showed an example of annotations. Uh, we also have, you know, a little bit more polished version of the annotation. Uh, this is created from our content system. So you can actually uh, create, you know, more advanced text with audio notes, URL links as well, if you want to link to, you know, third party sources. We can come over here and we'll, we'll add maybe a, a PDF document. So all of this can be done, uh, you know, on the fly in real time. We'll just add that in 3D space here. And let me attach a PDF. You can actually navigate through this PDF in the IQ3 environment as well. You know, if you're trying to create applications for, for users who might not have much experience in VR or with the model, uh, you have simplified approaches. So, for example, we can uh, set up what I call, you know, walkthrough mode, uh, where essentially, you know, we're going to navigate just between the various images I've just set up. So this could be an introductory video. The user can't move around. They're locked to position. And you can create a, a workflow where they navigate through the various stages of, of the training that you've set up. And so that's just a, a quick demo of, of how IQ3 can be used to facilitate both design review and, and these training scenarios uh, using the same underlying uh, data structure. You know, additionally, I think one other, you know, feature that, that we can do on the fly is also cable routing. You know, if you do want to do a first pass cable or, or wire routing, you can do that as well. I will pass it back off to David for any closing remarks. Great. Thanks, Colin. Great demo. I hope that gave everyone just a, a flavor of what the environment feels like. Again, it's it's a little bit different when you're in that um, that mirroring mode of the headset, as Joe talked about, where it's a little bit jumpy, but it, it gives you a, definitely a, a little bit more uh, feeling for, for what that environment feels like. Would like to go and take a few questions from our Q&A panel uh, and some that came directly to me through the, the chat. Let's see, this one is, um, I, I think, primarily for, for Joe. So, Joe, uh, everyone is talking about the acceleration of technology that's being implemented due to the restricted travel by COVID. Do you see that VR will significantly change the way you permanently work? I think you actually 
uh, commented on that a bit, but maybe just reiterate. The, uh, it was changing already. Um, it was just changing slowly and it was very customer specific. It still is more customer specific, but there's just no way we go back to the, the old way. So, and I think VR is a big enabler of this. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's another question here. I, I don't know that it really applies so much. You know, we, we talked at length about how AVL, you know, is, is more open to innovation and new technology, but maybe you can extrapolate a little bit and, and put yourself in, in the shoes of some of your peers in the industry about what kind of roadblocks you might face in trying to implement a VR solution in an enterprise way. Well, there's there's sort of a basic prejudice against it, as I mentioned, and then I, I use this example all the time, it's this stupid laptop, right? That it's this is a game, this isn't something we should take serious, and now we're equipping our employees who are working remotely with, you know, something they can go play games on. We've got, we've got to move past that. And so, you know, one of the things that I've been trying to do is, is educate my management. Luckily with this activity that we've got going on centrally, that's, there's a, you know, sort of a push down from the top as well as from us coming up from the bottom. But, you know, there's an education that has to be done uh, internally, uh, certainly with your IT department, developing a specification for a, a works, you know, a, a laptop that we just said this is going to be our standard uh, going forward and it will support this. That helped a lot, frankly, because it's just not really a question anymore about, well, is that a VR one or not? We just said, nope, the standard is this. It's honestly not a cost issue. You know, your tool is quite cost effective. The tools that we develop internally are quite cost effective. Uh, compared to the, the dollars that they save, they're very, very cost effective. Um, the laptop that supports a VR is, is only... What is this one? I think it was only about two hundred dollars more than a the same laptop without that video card, so not huge. The headsets are four hundred bucks, so that's not really the barrier. The barrier is really getting people to use it and start using it. And you know, the first couple times you use it, you're going to get vertigo. So you got to get in there, start using it, and just use it regularly, and then that stuff goes away. And then what you find out is that it's just so much more dynamic way to interact. Right now, I think the barrier is just getting people out using it. It's frankly why I was willing to do this webinar. <laughs> so uh, the more people we can make aware of the technology and that they're equipped, uh, you know, it's the rising tide rises my boat as well as your boat. And so that's good for, for everybody. And, and, you know, that's really what we need right now. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Uh, one more question, Colin, I think you can take this one. There's a question, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about compatibility and devices. And can you comment on the IQ3 compatibility with VR headsets and such? Yeah, you know, because we are operating through the web browser, you know, we're, we're pretty much compatible with any web browser device. Um, so that's, that's Oculus, that's HTC, that's, uh, you know, anything in the Windows mixed reality world. And there's a ton of them, Samsung, Dell, Lenovo, Acer, uh, et cetera. Uh, also, a lot of the more novel headsets operate through uh, Steam VR. And Steam VR, we support Steam VR as well. And so that encompasses a, a whole world of, of some of these, you know, higher end headsets um, that aren't, aren't quite for the consumer, but more, uh, you know, business oriented. Um, so really anything that, that runs through Windows Mixed Reality, Steam VR, or uh, Oculus uh, is, is supported. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Colin. Thank you once again for joining us, Joe. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, again, some really great insights there. Before we wrap up here and sign off, I want to uh, let everyone know that there is a, a real-time VR collaboration workshop next week uh, is the first session. We're actually going to do a series of these uh, over the next uh, four or five weeks. And want to invite everyone to their, so there's a sign up directly on the iq3connect.com website and you'll be able to join live in the VR environment through the desktop VR mode, or if you have your own headset, you can join in, in VR immersive mode as, as well. So want to make sure everyone is aware of that. Also, the fact that there is a free trial offer uh, on the iq3connect.com website, so you should feel free to, to sign up for that, and you can experience it all you want through your own cloud account. 
So again, thank you all for joining us. Thanks to our presenters. Thanks especially to AVL for allowing Joe to, to uh, come on board and do this with us. And we look forward to seeing you all at our next event.